there's this, there's this old theological notion that, that if there is no such thing as the afterlife, then everything we do here is meaningless. And I think quite to the contrary. And I think that many of the mystics, particularly the Hasidic mystics, my own tradition, did not really care much for the afterlife at all. And they did not see it as a place of value. They saw, and I mean that in a, in a, in a philosophical and theological sense, they didn't see eternity as vouching for value. They saw the moment as eternal. These are not, as you said before, we're not, we're not trying to get anywhere. There is no eternal you know, bank account that we're trying to invest in. We're trying to be fully present and fully and fully alive in these moments. And these moments are, are where that meaning is. And I think that is, that is vouchsafed for us precisely by death. Good afternoon. I'm talking to Zevi, who is the host founder of the YouTube channel uh, and podcast and community Seekers of Unity. And um, this is such an exciting opportunity for me, Zevi, to be able to speak to you. I um, feel connected with you because I've spent so much time uh, on your on your YouTube channel. And um, I could say that it is such a special, special, special place um, on the internet in terms of your uh, your your clarity, the the power and and organization you bring to these topics, and um, the the you're, you're you're a masterful educator and communicator, and you're engaging with a, a topic which is often like a very academic discipline, and it's something that's taught uh, at sort of arm's length from a very kind of sterile viewpoint, but you bring uh, a personalized component to it where you can present sort of an academic debate and you can say, you know, this is where I stand or this is sort of my personal experience. Um, and in addition to your like incredible playlists and essays, you know, for example, the recent ones you've done about the mysticism of Rabbi Moses Maimonides or what you've done on Spinoza and other great important topics, Hasidut, um, you have now uh, branching out into like documentary filmmaking and doing interfaith uh, religious stuff. And it's just um, such an incredible, incredible YouTube channel. And uh, I'm, I feel so honored and such a pleasure to be able to see you today and be able to talk to you. Thank you, Amichai. Wow, what a kind introduction. It's, it's not often that I get to actually interact one-on-one -on -one with people that have been appreciating and enjoying the material. And I spend most of my time alone, <laughs> like from my own bedroom or library, writing and thinking and editing and filming. So it's really, really nice to get to sit down and, and meet someone who's been appreciating it and get to talk about these ideas, which really are on my heart and mind all the time. So thank you so much. That was very sweet of you. Of course. Yeah. And, and also another thing that, that's amazing is um, you, it's, it's not just me who recognizes this. You, in your channel, you build community. You, you talk to other thinkers and authors and, and people who are interested. And there's always uh, such a connection made you know, you make as an interviewer, as someone who's exploring these concepts. Um, and even when you're, you know, you talk to people from all different uh, backgrounds and walks of life, there's always that connection and always a, a deep appreciation, I think, of your, um, yeah, of what you bring to this conversation. So yeah, uh, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's very sweet. I, I'm, I'm really, I'm really glad to hear that. And it's, it's what I, it's what I aim for. And I mean, with a, with a project name like Seekers of Unity, if I'm not finding a way to unite with people, <laughs> then I'm not living up to my own uh, calling and ideal. I think that um, I think maybe we'll talk about this as the conversation goes, but I think that there is a way of deep like comfort in in one's own identity, um, both as a person and within one's faith and practice, to be really to to go beyond and to connect to people in a very authentic way. And we can talk about the the psychology of that perhaps, but I'm I'm really glad that it comes across. And thank you for saying that. Yeah, there's there's a lot a lot I want to ask you. There's a lot I want to talk about, but I I like to try to think of you know like what's the um. I put a lot of emphasis on, on like a good starting question. So who knows if this is a good starting question or not. But my, my first question for you is, is the unity that you're seeking for, is that basically non-duality? This, <laughs> this sort of concept that at the, is at the core of so many religious traditions that, you know, uh, I, and you can maybe define what that is, that this, this, this non-dual awareness. Yeah, well, that, that is a really great question right off the bat. And I, I want to be really pedantic almost about language because I think language is so important. Um, we live in a world of language and we, you know, we create and construct our own narratives based on the stories we tell ourselves. And, and there's, a, there's a whole metaphysics of language. The Kabbalists believe that the world is literally ontologically created with words. The divine words and the Quran believes the same thing, the, Christ, the, the Muslim mystics and other traditions. So I hope I'm not going to be too picky on language here. And 
but but I think why we need to be careful about language is because a lot, a lot of these words get really abused and misused by so many people for all kinds of nefarious purposes, some 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 bad and some worse. Uh, words like metaphysics today and words like non-duality today and even mysticism today mean all kinds of crazy things out there and uh, people are peddling all kinds of uh, crazy <laughs> crazy stuff under those names. So let's let's take these words carefully because these words have a history and they have discussion and they have there's there's a whole discourse that exists around these words that that it's worthwhile engaging in so that but they're not just being lost off to people who are trying to you know sell Beetlejuice or whatever it is with the, with these words or, or sell t-shirts. So duality, non-duality. Non-duality implies the opposite, it's a negation of duality. Duality is a basic assumption of existence that things are bifurcated, separated into me and the world outside of me. Predominantly, that's the main duality that we experience. There's subject and object. I am the subjective subject. I experience things first person. And everything out there for me is just an object. Um, and we can assume that there are other subjects out there as well. Uh, in philosophy, this is called the, there's a, there's a philosophical thought experiment called uh, the problem of the zombies of how do we know that there are actually other subjects out there, a question in philosophy of mind. But assuming that there is this basic breakup of subjects, uh, either just one subject or multiple subjects, and that's, that's uh, another question. But uh, the basic dichotomy is that, there, that, there's, that there's me and then there's everything else, subjects and object. And that's one form of duality, a very prevalent form and an important philosophical form. There are, there are many, many other dualities and we live inside those dualities. There is past and present, present and future, day and night. There's words and silence, male and female. These are all dualities that we exist inside of happiness and sadness, good and bad. In, in every field, there's, there's dualities. The claim of non-duality, um, as opposed to simply the claim of unity. So we could say that everything is one. And that would be some form of monism or a unity. Um, Non-duality is saying something a bit different as far as I understand it. And I, and I, I, I could be wrong because it's a complex subject and it's, it's not my direct field of expertise. Non-duality is saying that the, 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 the fundamental nature of reality is neither dual, nor is it one, nor is it united. It transcends the categories of duality and, and unity. And that's why it's called non-dual, because it's not saying that it is simply one. It's saying that it's neither one nor not one. Uh, and this process of negation is a very, very strong theme amongst many of the world's mystical traditions. In the East, where the term non-duality comes from more, more organically and indigenously, there's a process called <clears throat> neti neti, which is to, to say no, no, to negate and negate. And it's a double negation. We negate and then we negate the negation itself. In Western mysticism, it goes under different names, whether it's it's apophatic theology or negative theology or Yudhiyas Ashlila in, in Hebrew. And th but the basic idea is the same, that we, when it comes to ultimate reality uh, or God and those terms are used interchangeably, not only can we not say anything, but we can only, and not only can we say that we know nothing, we have to negate all the things that we know. And through this process of negation, we come to some sort of truth. So non-duality is a negation is a, is a statement about the fundamental nature of reality, what we would call a metaphysical statement or an ontological statement. And it's negating that the world is either united or dual, um, which, is, which is a bit of a, a difficult thing to wrap one's head around. And it's not supposed to be an easy concept. A lot of these ideas, the way that they're framed in Eastern philosophy is that once you properly understand them, then you've reached enlightenment. So if, <laughs> if you're not getting this uh, from like a three minute <laughs> interview conversation then don't worry like it takes time and, and these ideas have to be internalized like if if the idea is just in your mind and not permeating your being then the idea hasn't yet made its way it's not the idea itself hasn't become non-dual right because it's still segmented and, comp and compartmentalized within you um so that's that that if that does that make sense i think that's basically what the idea is trying to point to what's what's the path if, if uh if for a buddhist i would think the path would involve a lot of meditation perhaps so maybe that's that's one path or there is, is that is that are there other paths I certainly certainly yeah there there i think there are many many paths there uh east and west uh meditation uh, in both eastern and western traditions is a very tried and trusted and, and tried and tested and true tradition uh there's a tradition in buddhism called zazen which is simply city meditation where one is not supposed to be doing anything 
part part of the notion here and why why non duality is such a comp- is such a slippery idea is because if you're sitting in meditation trying to achieve something, trying to reach some sort of final ultimate goal, you've then separated the goal from the journey or the or the or the ends from the means, and you've created a duality in your own mind. Um, which is why, for example, many Eastern thinkers will talk about how the ultimate realization is to realize that samsara and nirvana, which is a state of um, turmoil and rebirth and a state of extinguishing and, and waking up, uh, are, are really not two different things at all, that samsara is nirvana and nirvana is samsara. So if, if one is doing meditation, trying to reach some sort of place which they're not yet there, they never can reach there because there is nowhere to reach kind of thing. Um, I, think, I think that um, in... In the West, we have a similar notion when we speak about the divine essence. Uh, the term used in Hebrew for that would be etzem, where, where etzem or essence as a category is a category which, which shadows all categories. So it's beyond the dualities of light and darkness, of spark and vessel, of good and bad, of transcendent and imminent. And there are different ways of how one gets there, but, but ultimately, I think what's common about, amongst many of these traditions is this notion that you can't actually be trying to get there. Like you just have to kind of be, <laughs> and that's how, you, that's how you reach this non-dual. But even to say reach implies that you're not yet reaching it. So, so you can see why, why language is a bit tricky because language does automatically create the separation between what there is now and what, what might be expected uh, in the future. Um, and which is why a lot of non-duality is baked in with silence. I'm, I'm doing some work now on Maimonides. Maimonides reaches what I believe is some sort of, also some sort of uh, peak of ineffability of this moment when he can't say anything about God. And he turns back to the words of the Bible, of, of the, the book of Psalms, which says, that to you, God is silence. And he ends kind of on this note of silence um, because language is inherently dualistic. Um, I, I don't know if I answered that question. This is, we, we definitely picked a very, a very thick subject to start right. off with. There. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, also, um, you have Eliyahu on Har, uh, 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 which, which mountain is the, Yavzai? Chorev, Chorev, right. Kol Mamadaka, right. Um, where basically, uh, yeah, Eliyahu that or Elijah, the prophet is trying to apprehend God and, and he can't, um, God is not in all the uh manifestations of wind or sound uh but rather in, in the silence um and i was actually just uh recently you know reading reading a book on um on on a, an eastern uh this topic from an eastern perspective and maimonides came up and i thought that was a really interesting uh synthesis because of um the fact that uh, he also is like a proponent of this kind of negative theology this this sort of theology through negation um to I think our conversation is going to meander. I hope that's okay. I don't, you know, I, I hope it does. I, I really, I hope the conversation is a living and natural thing and, and living things meander. So I hope we do. Yeah. So, so I think, I think we'll, we'll stray and maybe we'll come back and whatever. Um, but uh, I, I was thinking when I, when I was appreciating your, your uh, amazing uh, series on, on Maimonides and, and I learned uh, so much from it. Um, when, when I was, when I was in yeshiva, when I was younger studying these topics, I was, I was under the impression um, based on my own, actual reading of, of the text of Maimonides. Also, uh, I had also at the time uh, read a, an article on this topic that for Maimonides, um, secular studies, he saw secular studies as um, being, uh, I don't know how you'd say, like, like a complementary to, maybe identical to, uh, a part of Torah study. Um, is, that, is that the way you read him as well? It's an interesting question whether he sees it as part of Torah study or something other than Torah study. Um, there's, a, there's a very beautiful distinction um, made by a later thinker who in some ways is following in the footsteps of Maimonides, uh, Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, uh, our Lord and Savior, who says that um, the study of science and mathematics and physics and, and medicine is the study of God's world and study of Torah, study of God's word. Uh, I, think, I think that's a very sweet distinction. For Maimonides, it seems like he does believe that there is a distinction between the two. Maimonides does believe in prophecy and revelation, although he has his own idiosyncratic understanding of what those terms mean, as he does for almost every subject in religious philosophy and in Judaism. 
but he does see there to be a difference, a quantitative difference between wisdom and between revelation. So he writes about Aristotle, for example, who represents the pinnacle of wisdom. And Aristotle, remember, is not just a philosopher, he's also a scientist. Uh, those terms haven't yet been distinguished in Aristotle's day. And, and Maimonides sees, uh, Maimonides himself also crossing fields, uh, sees them overlapping in, in his philosophical and scientific master. And he writes about Maimonides in the letter to his translator, Shmuel ibn Tibbet. And he talks about him as reaching, having reached the pinnacle of human wisdom, um, sans prophecy so so prophecy for him still sits above that uh, and particularly the and when it comes to prophecy he has these famous gradations of prophecy which he enumerates both in the guide and the Mishnah Torah um, and the prophecy of Moses he again places in a categorically distinct category from the rest of the prophets um, and what functionally what, what makes Moses different is that Moses is the lawgiver Moses gives us the Torah um, and, and the 613 commandments, which are normative for Jews, for Jewish practice, derive from the words of Moses, not from any other prophets. We don't learn law from Isaiah or Jeremiah or Habakkuk or anyone else. So it does seem that there's a double distance between, uh, between Torah and between, between wisdom. Uh, and this is a distinction which carries on from, from the Talmud. So the Talmud speaks about how uh, if one says that there is wisdom amongst the Gentiles, they should be believed. If one says there's Torah, there's revelation amongst the Gentiles, then they shouldn't be believed, which is a very fascinating statement in and of its own. But, but there's this distinction here we see between, between revealed wisdom and, and human wisdom, um, which, is, which is an interesting one. Maimonides, however, despite seeing two separate categories here, does see them both as prerequisite necessities of coming to know God. Um, and God, in a, in a sense that will be emphasized a, a bit more strongly by Spinoza, who's a Maimonidean in his own way, God is in some sense um, somehow deeply related to, if not identical, with the, with the laws of reality and the and nature of reality itself. So therefore, to understand reality, uh, Maimonides writes this, that, that although there are elements of the divine which we cannot ever know, and Maimonides writes that, the best we can do is to study the world, the patterns of God, the world of God. And through that, we come to know something of God. So it's, Maimonides sometimes seems to say that and sometimes backs off that position, depending on how uh, agnostic he's being about the potential for knowing God. But what he makes very clear um, in Guide 351, that's part three, chapter 51, is that in order to come to what he frames in, his, in, the, in the metaphor of the, the parable of the palace, what, to come into the chamber, the inner chamber of the king, the presence of the king, one has to go through a complete study of logic and physics and science and ultimately metaphysics, the divine science as it's known in the Middle Ages, uh, and then Torah and mitzvot to train one's mind to then come and meditate on the presence and fullness of God. So it's very clear from Maimonides that they are different, but they're, they're both necessary steps to coming to an understanding uh, and also more than just an understanding, but, but a, an experience perhaps um, of God. Yeah, that's, that's a really beautiful concept. And it's something which I think has had a big impact on my life uh, personally. Um, and it's something which I don't, I don't see so, see echoed in so many other places. Uh, you know, growing up um, in, in an Orthodox Jewish world, um, and uh, in a world where there was an emphasis on, on also uh, being you know, educated from a secular perspective in addition to an Orthodox Jewish perspective, um, I was very attracted to this notion of like finding the divine in physics. And eventually that led me to uh, get an undergraduate degree in physics. And um, I think for, for a long time, I, I sort of like got the undergraduate degree and it was like, well, was, was my modernities right or wrong? You know, because this isn't, I don't feel any closer to God necessarily, <laughs> you know, I could, I could maybe solve a partial differential equation or something like that, but you know, so what? Um, but, but I do think, you know, maybe with the, some perspective that, that, and also maybe with uh, now that I'm more attracted to, you know, meditation and, and sort of Eastern, uh, Eastern religious ideas, uh, this idea of like a meditation on, um, yeah, the, the texture of reality uh, or something like that, um, trying to, uh, you know, put, put, the reality under under a microscope and 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 the way in which that's a very mind expanding potentially um, and liberating kind of practice. 
Yeah, it, it is an interesting question whether, or, or rather how the study of something like physics or the, or the, 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 the material nature of reality brings one closer to God. And I think that there's a bit of a begging the question going on, which is like, what is it that we mean when we say God? And what do we assume that we might be brought closer to? Um, and we probably have to step away from like a simplistic childlike notion of, of some sort of theistic uh, deity, because that's probably not the kind of God that physics is going to bring one closer to, right? Um, if anything, a study of physics and and physical cosmology will take one away from such a such a concept of God, which I'm sure is something that you've thought about and grappled with um, as a as a Jewish physicist. Sure. <laughs> um, but but um, I think if you think about God a bit differently, um, the way that the mystics and I, and I think about that term very broadly, and I I include all going all the way back to someone like Parmenides and Heraclitus, and all the way up to someone like uh, Carl Sagan, let's say, and Einstein where you have people that are deeply concerned about the physical nature of reality with wildly different methodologies and doing this thousands of years apart, but that see some sort of deep uh, intercorrelation between, between logos and ontos, between rationality and reason itself and, and being itself. And, and, and with the assumption that, and, and what science, I mean, I think the most incredible thing about science is, uh, and this has been said by many, many scientists, that the fact that the universe is amenable to understanding at all like there's no reason why the universe should should fit with the the human brain and that we should be able to understand it and see patterns and make predictions like that itself seems to be the most astonishing thing and through such a exploration of science it does bring i think to a sense of wonder and a sense of expansion a sense of awe and a sense of, of beauty and um and i think even to a properly religious experience um, and there's a whole subject that was studied called nature mysticism, um, the romanticists and, and many of the idealists, Wordsworth and others. But I think you see this, I think you see this even in people like, like Einstein and, 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 and Carl Sagan, who aren't religious figures in any classic sense, but have a deeply religious sensibility when it comes to their relationship with the cosmos and with time and with gravity. And I think that that's really possible. I think that when we explore science at a at a deep enough and a advanced enough level we begin to see something not just mathematical and coherent going on which is extraordinary but we begin to see something poetic and awe-inspiring and 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 moving um, and something that brings us to to gratitude and to awe and to humility and to kindness and these are all religious values and and in doing so there is a potential to encounter divinity in that, I think. Um, and it might be a question of what exactly, what kind of divinity is this? I mean, the easiest kind of answer would be a pantheistic notion or deistic notion, which is very easy to, to dovetail with this, uh, this form of scientific or, or, or naturalistic mysticism. But I think that by reframing the God that we're looking for, we may be able to find something quite meaningful and beautiful and inspiring. Uh, in in the physical world mm -hmm. yeah um i'm just letting letting your words sink in a little bit um take your time <laughs> it also seems you know you mentioned uh the god of einstein uh and einstein said that I, I, if i if i recall correctly and if the quote is not apocryphal uh that that he resonates with spinoza's god um, yes so th this sort of ties in a little bit to uh you know your the, the videos you've done, done on spinoza for example um and yeah i mean i guess what i'm thinking about what's sort of germinating in my head right now is you know sort of this this big question which um i feel like is at the core of of your channel to some extent uh something that i'm i'm, I'm thinking about always when i learn from you and uh, you know it's just how do we how do you balance this this question of differentiation and similarity you know because <laughs> Because we, we drew we drew a line, you know, we drew a nice line here. It was very beautiful, uh, very eloquent, very poetic about uh, Maimonides finding divinity in nature, you know, and, and we drew a line to that to sort of a Einstein and, and a kind of pantheistic view. But but at the same time, so there's 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 a parallel there. It seems there's a line there. There's a connection there. But also, it's it's the, probably not right to say it's wrong to say that Maimonides is the pantheist. I would I would assume. So there's this, <laughs> there seems to be this this core tension that that we're wrestling with, right? Yeah. So. Okay. 
let's 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 do that one step at a time. Firstly, the, the quote that you attributed to Einstein is correct. It's not apocryphal. It was a letter that he wrote in response to an American rabbi, which reached out to him um, over over um, facts or some sort of mail and asked him, "Do you believe in God?" And he said, "I believe uh, in the God of Einstein." Who? Um, Spinoza. Who, in the, sorry, yeah, in the, in the God of in the God of Einstein, in the God shit, in the God of Spinoza, who can be discovered in the orderly nature of, of reality, or something like that. Um, and I think that I think that Einstein's mysticism, if we can say this, and I do want to make a video on the channel devoted to the subject, goes beyond that. Einstein, there's a quote from him, uh, which is a genuine quote as well, I believe, where he says that the something I could pull it up here, but something to the effect of like the the great uh, optical uh, optical illusion of of our lives is that we see ourselves as separate from the rest of the universe and the cosmos. When in reality, um, like this is just a, a, tr a trick played by like time and really we are uh, just one part of the entire universe and 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 that discovery says einstein is like the greatest potential human discovery and it should lead us to to bliss and compassion and, and love and what seems to be a thoroughly uh, a line which is thoroughly coherent with with mysticism both in its metaphysics and in its ethics um so i think i think einstein really did go the full distance with that this question of the question of, um, I thought you were going to go take this in a different direction, the question of difference and unity. You know, there's a subject that comes out of the work of uh, Derrida, Foucault and others, which is about like the identity, of, the identity of difference, that, uh, which is a bit of a trippy idea, which kind, kind of brings us back, I think, to the non-duality subject, uh, which, we, which we may have to get to hopefully by the end again. I hope but, so. But, but on a, let's, let's without, without getting too postmodern or, or mystical just yet about it, um, let's let's take these categories as actually distinct dual categories that there is difference and there is commonality um, and and is this a fair uh, comparison to be making between between Maimonides and his god and and the god of, of a pantheist like Spinoza for example a god to whom uh, one cannot really pray and one cannot really um, you know doesn't doesn't have personality in, in the way that a, that the god of religion does I think that Maimonides God um, firstly is a very very complex and very simple God uh, and simple in, in in the sense that the that theologians use the term where where, there, where it's entirely uh, non-composite and there's something which Maimonides writes and even in the opening to his Mishnah Torah um, and I think that Maimonides plays a bit of a game with these words I'm going to try and say this carefully so that I don't get myself into trouble. But Maimonides is both. Maimonides is both. Maimonides is many people. He is a physician. He's a metaphysician. He's a scientist and a doctor. He's an astrologer. He's a political advisor. He's a philosopher, a halachist, and a community leader. And he he understands that he's writing to many many audiences. And I don't think that he's using any sort of dissimilitude or, or saying something which is untrue to one audience that he's not saying to another. Um, although there is potential that his ideas do change over time as he progresses as a thinker and as he travels geographically and encounters different philosophies, that's certainly a possibility. But, um, but I think that what Maimonides is doing is he assuming at least a base level of consistency along his thought, just to make this point, what Maimonides is doing is that he's he's talking about he he's trying to lead people to a certain notion of God, uh, which is quite a radical notion and is perhaps not the notion that we are taught in Hebrew day school, and he's trying to do that without shocking people, without scaring people. Um, and whether he succeeds or not is an interesting question because we know that historically Maimonides' books get burnt for like a century after he passes away. So, so it doesn't seem like he flew entirely under the radar and. And, and, and people suddenly picked up on, on the Maimonidean project, as it's been called. But Maimonides is working with the tradition to try and show how the tradition itself is asking for its own purification and asking for its own reification. So the first 70 chapters of the Guide to the Perplexed, which he's not writing to the public, he's writing it to one student or people like that one student. So he's writing it to a very advanced elite and it's very clear within the text what he expects the reader to already know. And it's, it's most of philosophy already. It's definitely all of Aristotle. And he, he's trying to strip, he says the first 70 chapters, stripping away notions that God has corporeality, God has a body. So Maimonides encounters 
the God concept of Judaism of his day, and he finds it to be wanting and lacking and frankly idolatrous, right? If, if there's to believe that God has a body, that implies multiplicity and duality within God, and these are all things which are just idolatrous for a philosophical um, theologian like Maimonides. And Maimonides is trying to clean up the God of Judaism um, and bring them back to what he believes is the true God of Israel. Uh, and the question of whether this is closer in the final in the final products, the God of Athens or Jerusalem is, is a great question. But Maimonides certainly doesn't see those as, as opposites. Maimonides sees the wisdom of Athens, let's say, as the best articulation for the truth of Jerusalem. That's perhaps a way of putting it. And so while in the Murnavuchim, sorry, while in the Mishnah Torah, which he's writing to the public, and in his pastoral letters to the public, he'll speak about God in more, in terms that are more um, colloquial and, and speak about God's providence and God's revelation and God, in ways that will sound more uh, acceptable to the public and ways that won't sound anything at all like the God of Spinoza or Einstein. When you read God of, when you read Maimonides in the guide, where he's really grappling with a very complex theology, uh, which is its own mix up of Neoplatonism and Aristotelianism, which is something we discussed in the series. Uh, because of a text called the Theology of Aristotle, which Maimonides assumes to be Aristotelian, which is really Neoplatonic, and he, he gets these two gods, uh, one which is God, which is simply um, this unity of, of knowledge, the, the, know, the, know, the self-knowing knower, the know which knows itself, um, which then, which then uh, perpetuates a series of separate intellects which bring the cosmos into being, versus a god of Plotinus and Neoplatonism, which is totally beyond being and totally inaccessible and ineffable, um, and and that's a, that's the real radical god of Maimonides, and, and neither of those gods are the god that we find openly in Tanakh, in in, in Hebrew in Jewish tradition. And I think that if you if you if you have a sense of where Maimonides' destination, theological destination, is in the guide, and then you read Mishnah Torah, which he's writing to the public, particularly the first book and the first few chapters where he lays out his metaphysics in his foundation to the Torah which is the opening of Sefer Manda, the Book of Knowledge, you could see him trying to introduce those more refined philosophical ideas to the public. So when we see a tremendous amount of disparity between Maimonides and Maimonides' God and someone like Spinoza and Einstein and their gods, it may be because we're reading Maimonides of the popular texts, the public texts, and we're not reading them in light of his more private texts, his private epistles to, to one student, where it seems, to, and I mean, there's, there's, there's a whole cottage industry of academia, and some people say that, like, which, which one is the true Maimonides? Is it really the Maimonides of the guy, really, of the, of the Mora? But um, I like to, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a thinker who likes to bring things into unity, and I, and I like to see Maimonides as a unified person, and it doesn't seem like he does any of these projects frivolously, like he really gives uh, years of his very precious time to both of them, and and I don't I I, I think the case to dismiss either of them as secondary um, seems to be an untenable one for me. So I think that if you read the the God of the Mora in light of the God of the Guide, um, you'll see how Maimonides' God is actually a lot more in line with Spinoza's and Einstein's God in some very and and in some really, really fascinating ways. And then there's a lot of creative religious philosophy and religious hermeneutics that he tries to explain how that God concept still functions with our ideas of mitzvot, of commandments, of, of nevoah, of prophecy, of revelation, of hitzgalut. And, and that's where a lot of his really, really creative theology comes into play to show how this real pure God, the God, which I think many of the mystics point gesture to, as does Plotinus, one of his philosophical sources who is a mystic, um, how he tries to integrate that with the tradition. And that's a very fascinating project that he, that's like sort of the second step once you've, once you've come to this, um, once you've agreed with this position that I'm, that I'm laying out here, then the question is, how then does he fit that God into Judaism? So I, I hope that made some sense. Yeah, yeah, it does. Um, I, 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 I guess, I guess it's a very satisfactory answer um, with respect to Maimonides. It's a very nuanced answer, very complex answer. Um, maybe, maybe we'll come back to it because maybe it's a tension that keeps arising, you know, this Certainly. tension between, uh, diversity and, and unity. Um, let's see here. Let me think for a second about how, how I want to, um, sure, to sure. Tie this in. I also got to say, I really appreciate the opportunity to like think extemporaneously about these ideas. 
perhaps like the reason why it take, it's taking me time to, to articulate the thought is because I'm thinking fresh with you here. We're thinking mm -hmm. together. So, so thanks for bearing with me while I, while I try and formulate and articulate these, these thoughts. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Um, and, and it's also in, in these conversations in general, uh, especially this conversation, but others, um, there's a, there's a sense that, uh, you know, I'm changing, you know, over the course of the conversation, I'm, I'm absorbing new information and I'm, you know, trying to make sense of <laughs> new, yeah. new concepts. And so, yeah, so it's yeah. it fun. It, it's certainly the case neurologically as well. You know, our brains are constantly, you know, for every every new thought, new interaction, new challenge, where we we don't we don't walk into Heraclitus says that we don't step into the same river twice because the river is not the same, the person not the same. We could say we don't, we don't, we don't join the same conversation or the same podcast twice. You know, the podcast is different and we're different. Yeah. So so let's let's there's so many ways. I'm thinking right now I have like at least five different ways I can go. Um but we had to pick one. Um, <laughs> I love that you sent me last night like like 35 questions. That you, I'm like, you understand that each one of these questions is like a good 45 minutes to, know, to even yeah. unpack. <laughs> Very audacious of you. A question I think about a lot these days, because I, my, my, my personal story um, is, is recently in the past year or so, I've, I've been become very interested, very attracted to uh, Eastern, Eastern ideas of, of spirituality. Um, and, and, you know, refracted through my own, you know, minute sort of, you know, uh, reading life and, and my own experience or whatever. Um, how do you think about that distinction, for example? So, you know, because uh, that seems to be like as big a gulf as you can find, you know, two, two polar opposites of the uh, religious uh, mystical uh, spectrum. How, how do you think about that difference versus unity? Yeah, I, I think um, to be a bit bombastic about this, why not? I, I think there's actually, um, I think there's no distinction. <laughs> I, think it's a, I think it's a false dichotomy. I don't think, and I'll back up what I'm saying. I'm just, I'm just being a bit silly. I think that there's no such thing as the East and West. Uh, East and West, obviously, uh, if you think about it for a second, are, are fictitious points of reference that, that don't have any absolute value at all. There is, there is nothing in the DNA of, of lands over by uh, what we call India and China and Japan that, that, are, that are Eastern or Western. I mean, East in reference, like even North and South, there's no reason why, why North is North and North. These are arbitrary human constructions. Um, and... <sighs> And to continue to play this kind of a bit of a silly deconstruction here, but but I'm doing it for a serious reason. Like, if you know, there's this uh, philosophical experiment that comes out of out of the Greeks, of uh, which which is applied to philosophy of identity. Uh, Ship of Theseus is one example, and there are other forms of it. Like, if you have a, if you keep adding like uh, grains of grass to a to a how when does it become a pile, right? And if you take one away, is it not? So if you're in the east and you start working west, like when at what step do you take? Did you now leave from from the east and you're now in the west or did you leave from the east you're now in the middle like and if that border changes did that like did the geography change and did the psyche and psychology change as well so um the the serious point that i'm trying to make here beyond this kind of joking here is that part of the way that i'm trying to think about the world is not in binary categories but in terms of gradients right that there's a spectrum of things and on the far end of one spectrum we call east on the far end of the spectrum we call we call south uh, and the same thing happens with day and night, right? There's no moment where it stops being night and starts being day. Day turns into dusk, uh, between the, the luminaries as it is in Hebrew. And then imperceivably that transitions by gradation into what we call night. But there was never a point where I was like, oh, that that microsecond was one, this one, one is it. And the same is with gender. I mean, we, we know we know historically and and today that there's a whole there's a whole spectrum. There's There's male and then there's typically female. And then there's everything between where there's, you know, psyche of biology of one and this of other and chromosomes other and and we can any any binary any duality that we think exists in in sort of rough and ready forms that are totally split between the two. If we just look carefully, there's always a bridge of gradients that lie between them. Um, even Aristotle, when he gave his four part dichotomy and taxonomy of reality between the uh, the between the, uh, the causes, the, the final cause, like the... no, 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 no. I I know the terms in Hebrew. I don't know them in, in English. Um, domem tamer chaim Oh, sure, sure. It's like like a, between like the inanimate, in that, right. the, the vegetative, right. animal, and and rational. Uh, in Aristotle's terms, um, that was very yeshiva should mean. I don't do that often. <laughs> uh, Aristotle posits that there's that there are beings and entities that that rest that are between them. That are, there's one. There's some. There's things that are between the inanimate and the vegetative between the vegetative and whatever it is. Um, so this, the whole notion of any, 
of anything that's an absolute binary is just, I think it just doesn't stand up to, to examination. Um, and to, to press this point on your question of East and West, and not just to be uh, a nunnik, not just to be pedantic about this, is that they're, firstly, what's happening East and West is that there are humans thinking about how to uh, best live life and humans thinking about what the nature of reality is. And the human brain uh, on the evolutionary scale between what we call East and West is not radically different. There is no, there is no radically um, different neuro chemical makeup between what we consider an Eastern person and we, what we consider a Western person. There's a shared biology. Uh, one, of, one of the Greeks said, I am human, maybe it means Cicero, I'm human and therefore nothing human is foreign to me. I think that we could say the same of East and West. So human, East and human, West are both human and therefore they're not foreign to each other. Um, that's number one. Number two is that there's a tremendous amount of, there's a tremendous amount of cross-pollinization of thought that happens. We know, we know that Alexander travels uh, eastward in his conquest um, and with him goes the Greek philosopher Pyro. Um, and there's many historians and philosophers who believe, people who dispute as well, who believe that Pyronism, that, that what, what later gets known as skepticism, um, shares very deep um, commonalities with basic doctrines of Buddhism uh, because there is a, a, a cross fertilization of minds, there's a meeting of minds there, um, particularly someone like Adi Shankara. Uh, who's later a Hindu philosopher is believed to have been influenced by that by that cross as well, and and this influence runs one, runs both ways. Um, and I'm not I'm not kind of I'm not going to stake a position in this because there are people who who dispute this account and don't think that it's an accurate comparison. But I think there is very good reason to believe that there really is a crossing of ideas. And then I mean part of and then there are many many people who who it's very hard to figure out if they're east or west. Many of the philosophy that happens in Pakistan and in Iraq and in Iran and India, um, many many of them are what we would call Western characters living in Eastern worlds, and many of them are Eastern characters living in Western worlds. And, and there is there just is a lot of uh, cross pollinization going on. That's that's firstly on sort of a general conceptual and then historical level. Um, on on a more of a realistic level, I think that I think that the basic um, sort of morphology and structure of, of Eastern and Western thought uh, is thought to be different. Um, but I think that different, the difference as well is in many cases superficial and it doesn't hold up to examination. Um, we have these kind of um, general, somewhat often just racist stereotypes like, oh, the Western mind is active and the Eastern mind is passive or like the, uh, just like, just like these things that don't, like we're talking about like millions and millions of people, like these, these, these one like category distinction don't, they just don't, they don't work. And I think that when we look at um, the philosophical work that's done in the East and in the West, um, there is a tremendous amount of fascinating formulations of logic uh, that happen in the East and the West, both what we would consider classical and non-classical logic that happened in both traditions. There's a tremendous amount of mysticism, which is my area, uh, which happens in remarkably similar ways uh, someone like Carl Jaspers did a lot of this early research, how uh, much of what we could consider probably mystical in the pre-Socratics um, seems to be um, quite, quite closely paralleled conceptually uh, with what's going on in, in Eastern thinkers. Um, and I, I, I do think that if we take points of comparison, point for point, East and West, um, we can find valid comparisons uh, across. Uh, and that's a bit of a controversial statement because some people don't like to be translating between traditions, but I think that we can and should be doing that work. Um, and yes, there may be general distinctions of, of temperament and culture, and I'm not trying to dismiss that or to try and, to try and homogenize uh, all humans. I think that diversity is a beautiful thing, but I think that to assume that there's some sort of inherent uh, ontological difference or some sort of difference that transcends um, doctrine and practice, I think that's a mistake. And I think that if, particularly in the field of comparative mysticism, there's a lot, a lot of fruitful work to be done um, when we compare traditions. And, and as well, there's, there's kind of this myth of the East that was created by Orientalist scholars where they went to the East and, and kind of, and either were trying to find some sort of Christian narrative um, that'd be like, oh, that, 
that deity that's just Jesus or some sort of thing like that uh, which was just like missionary efforts or later orientalists who weren't doing it religiously but were like oh the uh the 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 eastern mind is as we said before the eastern mind is inherently uh more natural and the western mind is more instrumentalist or whatever like nonsense distinction they came up with I think that a lot of that holds today um, because what we know of the east is still uh, only like through the popular forms of Neo Vedanta and Buddhist modernism and people who brought that across uh, like Humphrey and Suzuki and Alan Watts and and Huxley who brought uh, Eastern philosophy to the West but they brought a very thin uh, representation of what was going on and when we think about oh the West has uh, you know it's so dogmatic and so theological and it's it's so un uh, mystical and so un Eastern uh, we don't realize that like there are many many um, there's like a whole richness and wealth of Eastern traditions that have gods and lots of gods and many gods and many folk religion and many folk practices. And they're not all like Zend out mystics. So I think it's, uh, I think it's important to, to sort of rediscover uh, as people who identify and as are identified as Westerners to rediscover the East. Um, and even, even to say a word like the East, like how do you include uh, <laughs> all of the thinking and spiritual activity that, that happened in, in China and Japan and India, like under, under one word, it's just, it's, it's a bit of a crazy thing, but, um, I think there's a lot of work to be done. I mean, a lot of, a lot of historians and scholars of religion have said that the most, uh, vital thing that, that can potentially happen in the century will be a proper discovery of Eastern thought. Um, and I think that's happening slowly and, and the philosophical world is starting to take Eastern philosophy seriously. Um, and I think it's, I think it's upon all of us to, if we believe, I'll, I'll end with this one, with this one thought, if we believe that like human nature, um, there's something fundamental about it, either psychologically or biologically across the globe, right? We just don't have enough distance. We're not talking about different galaxies here. We're talking about one tiny globe. If we believe that human nature is, is some, is some, is somehow, um, analogous across across continents and if we believe that the nature of reality itself right which is which is certainly an easier case to make is somehow analogous across continents then the work to be done by humans examining the human nature and the nature of reality should have commonality and communicability and translatability and universality in it uh, and i do believe that's the case and i think that a lot of the work is to do that work carefully respectfully thoughtfully uh, and and um honestly yeah, and I'll add maybe to that list of uh, commonalities, the experience of being a conscious, a consciousness, an embodied consciousness in, in this world, and and what it means to exist. Um, but maybe that's subsumed under the category of you know reality and, uh, um, and 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 the fact that we're all human. Um, and and I'll just you know I'll say that this is this is of course you know uh, as you know as well as anyone and, and you've talked about it's a topic of controversy and a topic that people you know uh, you know like to debate about. Uh, but from my perspective. The, the, the importance of being able to translate between traditions, the project of trying to translate between religious traditions is, is so important to me, you know, just on, on a personal level. Um, in, in a world where we're like uh, suffering from lack of understanding and like a lack of connection between different cultures and different people, um, where, where, where divisiveness is a, is a threat to, you know, people's lives uh, on an ongoing basis, um, the project of, of finding that commonality, you know, in my own personal life, some of the most uh, important and, and transformative experiences have been interfaith experiences where, uh, you know, I, I, I prayed with uh, my Muslim friends at a mosque or, or something like that. Um, and a last piece to this is, is there's a sense in which I feel, for better or for worse, I don't, I don't want to put a value judgment on this, but I, I do feel, again, imagine this had no value judgment. I do feel stuck, you know, with my religious upbringing. Like, it's not, it's not going anywhere, you know what I'm saying? Uh, you, you, I can't, I can't, rid myself of it but um that there's no reason that that shouldn't uh that should preclude me from uh you know being able to to benefit from other other sources of, of wisdom and, and tradition um and if and if the emphasis is on the fact that you know my my religion is incompatible with with someone else's spiritual tradition then uh then that that's such a, an impoverished kind of world to live in yeah, I'm I'm in full agreement with you on this point, and it's it's not a point which I often bring up in my in my work or in my acad more academic discussions because this the case they are presenting that like there's a real need like on a human survival level um, like what we would call in in Jewish theology um, uh, what's, the, what's, the, what's the expression is uh, 
uh, Yeshua Alam, like the very like like society and civilization itself. There's certain like <laughs> there's certain things that we that we do to to maintain that. Um, and th this point of th the general way that we think about religion, that we, that we practice religion, which is generally so uh, us and them, and and we have the truth, and and there must be wrong, and and it, this this inherent divisiveness that is like seems so deeply baked into religion. Um, which seems to be, as far as I understand, the prevalent model that religion is being practiced. Like there's, I think that there's like a moral, social, political imperative to think about doing religion other ways, right? When we, when we, when we try and embark on something of a perennialist project to try and do this work of translating and to try and promote understanding and encounter between traditions, um, which I don't, which I don't think is, I don't think, I don't think it does any violence to religion. I think, if anything, it strengthens it. But I think that um, I think that not doing this work is is so important. And this is this is not really a point that it's not really a valid point in an academic context because academically we're looking to be to find our methodologies that are sound and to and to to make sure that we're taking you know all the all the evidence into 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 account and to. But I think part of the evidence to be taken into account is like, what is the motivation? Like, why do we do scholarship? Why do we do academia? Like, what is is there perhaps? I, I don't think it's value free, and I think that if if there are any values that we can get behind, it's like the fact that we all need to be living on this planet together in harmony and coexistence. And I think that religion, as such a force for division and such a potential force for unity and coexistence, like this this the work. That I'm trying to do, I think, I think is is really important socially as well, and it's 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 something which I do try and bracket when I'm doing my more scholarly and academic work because it's because it's not an academic point, but it's but it's like a real human point. Um, it's something actually I, I just did this discussion last night with Justin and Philip um, over at their channels Esoteric and Let's Talk Religion, and uh, a point which Philip made, which is like it's like this like this is really this is really important. Like the way he framed it was that even if it's not true, even if that, even if we're wrong, this would be a really, really important narrative to be pursuing. And, and it may be that it's also true. Um, and I think, I think the importance of it is something which, um, which sometimes even in my own mind falls to the back of my mind, but I think it's, I think it's work which uh, inspires action in that direction. And I know you've seen some of my work trying to do some of my own, uh, I, I don't like this word, uh, interfaith work, but we could talk about, we could talk about that. But um, but I just want to talk to the to the last point that you brought up about about one's own religious tradition, um, sort of being a burden or a, or a shackle, um, a ball and chain that's precluding them from from having encounter with other traditions. I I really don't think uh, at all that the way forward is for people to abandon their religions. And you know, many many social thinkers thought that Marx and others thought that oh, the future is going to be secular. And uh, and religion is after the Enlightenment and after Kant, religion is finished, and and after Darwin, certainly, and and that's it. Religion is on the way out, and and we're heading towards a secular utopia. Uh, it certainly seems the the numbers are just wrong, and and religious people are growing. There's a sociologist who put out a recent book called uh, "The Righteous Shall Inherit the Earth," to quote the quote in the New Testament, and just looking at birth rates in secular atheistic countries versus religious birth rates, which are just through the roof. Um, it doesn't look like religion is here to go anywhere. There's a lot of talk now about the about not disenchantment, but the myth of disenchantment, about how we were never disenchanted, that we've always been religious societies and driven by religious values. Um, Marx, in his in his analysis of society, sees three potential points of influence, um, two of them which he's not worried about, and one which he is. The two which he's not worried about is art and philosophy. Um, and the third one she actually is very worried about is religion. Religion has the power to influence people. And I don't think religion is going anywhere anytime soon. And, and I think that's good because I think that religion done well can be an incredibly powerful tool for the betterment of human lives on, on this globe here. And I, and I don't think that the way forward is to abandon our particularity. I don't think that we achieve any sort of meaningful universality by getting rid of what it is that we are. We, can't, we cannot enter any kind of relationship Unless we are entering, if we if we're just stripping our own identity to to be present for someone else, then then there was no, then there's no one that's being present. There's a there's a great line from from Menachem Mendel of Kotsk. He said uh, he says like this, and I'll say it first in Yiddish and then I'll translate. He says, "Ich bin ich, 
weil du bist du und du bist du, weil ich bin ich. Ich bin nicht ich und du bist nicht du. I, aber ich bin ich, weil ich bin ich und du bist du, weil du bist du. Jetzt ich bin ich und du bist du und jetzt können wir reden. Which means, uh, in translation, he says, if I am I because you are you and you are you because I am I, then I am not I and you are not you. But if I am I because I am I and you are you because if you are you, then I am I and you are you. And now we can talk, now we can enter relationship, which means that we can only enter into relationship particularly in a religious sphere, when we're coming as people that are fully ourselves, fully embodied in our tradition. I think some of the greatest, the word which I don't, the word which I don't like using, which is, which is interfaith, I think the better word is interfaith. The people that are coming to do real interfaith work of the past century are people who are so deeply nurtured and steeped and living in their own particularity that they can come to universality. There's a notion that we have in Plotinus that the, the metaphysics of the mystic, they believe that the particular if you believe in, in some sort of theory of interconnectivity, the particular in its fullest iteration manifestation is a picture of the, of the universal, of the, of the entirety. It's the, the theory of all in all, uh, which a theory, which, theory which, which has room in, in mathematics and in, uh, in fractal theory and Mandel branch and all kinds of stuff. So, so I think that the, the way for religious coexistence Uh, and unity is not is never an abandonment of one's own religious particularity. I think it's with and through one's particularity in, in a very deep way. I don't think that that we can sit and talk to each other um, as post-religious people. I don't think that like secular. I saw a very interesting conversation um, between. It was very very fascinating. There, there was two rabbis and, a, and a, an imam. There was some TV show that was done a few decades ago back in the states. Uh, and the imam was very, very deeply serious about their, about their Islam. And the two rabbis were represented two very different poles of Orthodox Jewry. There was Avi Weiss, uh, who was a very liberal Orthodox Jew. He's the first Orthodox rabbi to give uh, smecha rabbinic ordination to a woman. And then there was Meir Kahana, who was uh, a blacklisted terrorist, who was a Knesset member, who was then thrown out. And his, his, uh, the movement which has followed him Uh, both in, uh, particularly in the States, has been deemed as a terrorist organization, a very active one, uh, with, with a whole kind of crazy, but, but basically the two opposite ends of the spectrum when it comes to politics. One was incredibly, incredibly liberal. One was incredibly, incredibly conservative and right wing. Um, and what was fascinating was that both of these rabbis were on stage with this imam, who was very proudly Muslim and was identifying with the Palestinian cause. And, and, and you would think that Weiss would have a better chance connecting with the Imam because Weiss is this liberal, progressive, peace loving. And what happened throughout the conversation was the conversation ended up being just between Kahana and this Imam because there was a point of commonality which they shared, which was their deep commitment to their religious practices. And the, the Imam, it's very, you can tell very, very quickly sense that in Weiss, he was not encountering a co-religionist. He wasn't encountering someone who was deeply religious and committed to his values like he was, although he deeply disagreed with Kahana and, and, and I do, and, and I hope many others do as well. There was a sense where he shared his religiosity and he shared his depth of particularity and over there there was potential for, for conversation and dare i say even potential for some sort of you know con con conciliatory uh, space and agreement and understanding um and the the legacy may have gone in in very bad directions may have been taken up by bad actors and i think it has um but but i think the, the sort of an extreme example to show that That it's, that it's not someone who's given up on their particularity, who's able to be a, a uniter and a peacemaker. It's someone who's, who's deeply particular, who's, who's able to do that work. Yeah, and this is, this is a fascinating issue. And it's, it's so complex and so subtle. And, and your, your voice, your perspective is, I think, um, it's, it's, it's great to hear. Um, I, a lot of questions for me come to mind, you know, for example. So just, uh, you know, an example of like, We, we, let's say, let's say we agree, let's say we agree that we're not, we're not striving towards a, a secular utopia, let's say. Um, but, but you, the, you get, you get, gets tricky with definitions, right? Because we were just talking about Einstein's God, you know, um, but we generally consider Einstein to be perfectly secular, you know, S you know, Sam Harris, who's a neo-atheist, is atheistic and as, you know, anti-theist as you could possibly get, you know, he has a meditation app, uh, which is, which is very uh, infused with a kind of You know, rationalistic spirituality that you know is heir to some you know uh, ideas that maybe um, you know find he, he probably borrowed from Buddhism, let's say uh, things like that. And so, um, 
I, I love what you're saying and I love the example you gave, but I, I just wonder if uh, it, it gets so tricky when we, when we have to get down to brass tacks and define, you know, what is secular, what is not secular? Um, you know, what, what does it mean to be, to be like fully engaged in your tradition? Yeah, I mean, these are interesting questions. Um, firstly, the, the point about Harris is correct. Um, I, I read not too long ago, actually a while ago already, um, time is moving, a book that he wrote called Waking Up uh, where he lays out, and his, his position may have changed since then, but at, at least at the time of him writing the book, um, he was deeply committed to some sort of secular version of Buddhism, uh, committed to, to the basic ontology and metaphysics um, of anatta, of, of non-self, of shunyata, of, of the will, of things spontaneously arising. Uh, so very, very much influenced by Buddhism and, and very much channeling that into, into his work, both, um, both in his meditation work and his, and his intellectual work. Um, so I think that's true. What does it mean to be secular and what does it mean to be religious? Um, those are great questions. Um, and I, I, I don't feel like I'm in a position to answer those accurately or, or scholarly because I, I haven't spent the time looking at the, sociological, the latest sociological definitions. The definition which, I will, which I'll offer as a layman, and I want it to be clear that it's coming <laughs> as such, um, is to, to get into a bit of the etymology here. To be religious uh, from, comes from the Latin religar, to be, to be bound, to be tied. To be, to be committed uh, to something covenantally. Um, the, the notion of being bound to something is a particularly rich idea, which, is, which works quite nicely in Judaism because, because um, men in Judaism bind their arms with tefillin. We, we wrap ourselves with a talit. There's a sense of, of being bound within the tradition. Um, there's a sense of, of being eternally bound. Um, the, the prophets speak about how the soul is bound in, in the bound of God. Uh, is a, it's something that we repeat by, by every Jewish funeral. Um, the secular, generally, I think, um, and I have no disdain, animosity, or antipathy for secularity. I, some of my best friends are secular. No, I, 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 think, I think that secularity, and, and if you're pulling up a, a definition, that, that would actually be nice. But I'll tell you, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what maybe the, I'll tell you what maybe the, what comes to me to mind to be to be a, a go-to sort of heuristic definition of secular is simply the opposite of being bound, which is being free, right? To be, to be, to be liberated from one's bonds. Um, in, 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 in Jewish, in Yiddish, we speak about religious and secular, we, we call it from and fry. Fry means to be free from the German fry, right? Um, and it simply means that one has, one has chosen uh, or, or being born into a, a construct, a, a scenario where they're free from from religious obligations and religious concepts and religious boundaries. Um, and I'm not, I'm, I'm not, I'm not here to be some sort of religious, um, like <laughs> preacher or like a lecturer or a demiog where it's like, oh, you have to be bound to something and you can't be free. No, like being free is very important and and secularity is very important. Um, but I think that. Um, I think that maybe the question is, what are we binding ourselves to? What is worth being bound to? What does binding ourselves in certain commitments um, mean for us in our lives? And in many ways, like even to, to break down this dichotomy as well, right? Secularity as well is, 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 is deeply imbued with a lot of religious binding. When a secular person enters a, a marriage, they're, they're, they're binding themselves covenantally to another person um, at least in theory, or or at least by words, until death do we part, right? And that's that's part of why the argument why why marriage is a religious contract is there's a sense where you're no longer free, you're binding yourself to them. And the question is, why do we bind ourselves to things as free people? Why do we give up on our freedom? And the answer simply is that sometimes relinquishing certain freedoms comes with benefits, benefits of being bound to something. Um, there's this great, great line in The Little Prince um, where the fox tells the little prince he says he says name me and tame me so that i will be yours and you will be mine and there's a sense of i see that as a very religious act they're binding themselves to each other in the act of naming uh naming also a very a very religious activity to be to be entirely free is to have no name right to to, to check the boxes other when you're asked what what do you identify as religiously T to to have a name to have an identity these are these are religious acts and i don't think any of us i don't think there's anyone living today that's entirely secular uh, which means that they're entirely free from any contracts that would be very religious because they'd be very committed to their freedom. Um, or there's no one who's entirely religious. We all have elements of freedom where, where we no longer live under feudal medieval, you know, systems where we have to 
practice certain, I have a tremendous amount of freedom in my religion. I'm very, I'm very proud of the amount of secularity and freedom that I have. So if those are, I, those, those definitions may be totally off the mark because I'm, because I, I haven't looked at the literature recently, but, um, but, but I think that's perhaps an, a, a way of reframing this as a question of uh, being, being, being the degree to which we are committed to things versus the degree to which we are uh, free from things. And I think both of those are important values and I'm not, I, I'm not trying to um, to put one over the other in, in any in any kind of way. I hear you. I, I want to just maybe try to hold space for a third a, a perspective of a viewer, a third perspective. I, I'm lucky. I consider myself lucky um, to to be to be basically happy with my religious upbringing. You know, um, and I, and I know I, I get the sense that you are as well, and many people are. But there's there are people who I know uh, who to them, a religious upbringing is actually a fairly traumatic. Kind of experience. It's a kind of authoritarian experience. Um, in certain Orthodox Jewish communities, it can mean being denied a secular studies education. Um, and so, how do you how do we hold place for that? How do, how do we hold space for that? There's, it's 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 a nice idea. I mean, it, it's very poetic what you're saying, and and it's it's a it's a language that in some sense I feel like I grew up with. I'm very familiar with, and and resonates in a positive way. The the, the liberation that comes through commitment, you know, like like a marriage or things like that. But um, to to many people. Uh, or at least the way that's often practiced in the real world. Um, that could be a very uh, stifling, um, limiting, and traumatic uh, experience. Yeah, absolutely, certainly. And, um, and I don't want to uh, minimize any of, the, any of the faults of religious communities, whatever, whichever religious nomination they are. Um, I, think they, I think there's a lot which they have to answer for uh, and are answering for. I think, I think this decade has been a time of reckoning for religious institutions. And, and I think we've seen a lot of that on, on many fronts. Um, <clears throat> I mean, not to be passe about this, but I think that like one of the, one of the early truths formulated by Aristotle, uh, truths of the human condition, that is, is that like everything needs to be done in moderation. We need to find the, the golden mean. We need to find the balance between extremes. And that's where eudaimonia, that's where human flourishing is. And I think that when religion is done too much in the direction of authoritarianism and it's and, and those bonds are tied too tight you cut off the constriction and there's no blood and there's no vitality and there's no novelty there's no chidush i think in judaism we have a incredibly strong value for the for the, for the tension between tension and looseness and how that needs to be maintained and and, and sometimes when we hold uh our own within our religion so tightly, we end up suffocating not only the people that we try to hold within the tradition, and we've all seen that. I have many, many friends who were suffocated in the very same religious communities that I grew up in, but we end up suffocating our own traditions because what we do is any of the creativity and the ingenuity and, and the divinity in those, in those individuals that they would have brought to our tradition, they get squeezed out of the tradition. I have, I have friends who are in tr incredibly tremendous artists and musicians and poets who had no space within a traditional yeshiva education, which we grew up in. And not only would they squeeze out of the tradition because, because these bounds were too tight, but the tradition itself now, now, now is so much poorer, we're impoverished, that these characters are no longer in, engaged in, in contributing to, to, the, to the world of religion in a way, and they still are in their own ways, they certainly are, but in a way which they could have been in a much more healthy and integrated way. And I think that's our, I think that's our own tremendous loss. And I think that we have to, we have to learn how to, how to have the self-security to not be strangling our own tradition and our own children within it. That's on the one hand. On the other hand, I think that the excesses of secularity, it's, 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 it's not hard at all to see how an excess of freedom leads to leads to meaninglessness and nihilism. And this is I'm not talking from here as some sort of rabbi who, who never went down a road of nihilism and, and meaninglessness. I, I go down these roads every every night and day. I, I live as a thoroughly secular and thoroughly religious person. And when my own secularity, I'm so I'm speaking here as, as an insider in some way, when my own secularity is 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 out of balance and is not being constrained by my own commitments to my commitments and to what I find to, to bound me into anchoring in my life. It's very easy for me to, to, to wander into, into the abyss, into, into the absurdism of reality. And, and I don't think that's a healthy place to operate from. I think, I think very few people can operate out of a space of deep nihilism and meaninglessness in a way that's kind and, and, and creative and beautiful and, and, and healthy. I don't think there's eudaimonia there. And I, so I think, I think very simply, and 
and, and sometimes when we when we just overgeneralize everything into oh sure like all extremes are unhealthy but i really do think this is the case here i think that there is religion done very well where it's very beautiful and very much a, a tool in human flourishing both in our personal life and in our interpersonal lives and in our relationship to to the world around us and i i, I see that and i and i want to strengthen that and i think there's a tremendous amount of secularity which allows for freedom allows for identity allows for expression and and that's something which needs to be respected and strengthened as well but then both of them have their extremes um and and those extremes are, are certainly not healthy you know i i'm living now in in jerusalem and i get to spend some time in, in tel aviv and i'm kind of back and forth between the two um and it's kind of funny because jerusalem represents a very very jerusalem is an incredibly religious city um uh, the, the whole place is pretty much closed down for shabbat and and I don't know what the what the percentage of the population here identifies as religious, but it's a very large one. And Tel Aviv is an incredibly secular city, um, where kind of every day of the week is is, is a party day, and, and Shabbat is not really much different. Um, and when I get to spend time in both of them, I get to really appreciate what each one has to offer. And I think that they need each other. If we only if if all of Israel was just Jerusalem, it would not be a great country and i think that there are many many places in jerusalem where we see where we see the extremes of it that, that aren't healthy in, in the way that and 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 then there are the excesses of of, of secularity and television which are unhealthy as well and i really do think that they both need each other and i think that the deep unity recognizes the value of both and i think that some of the founding uh religious figures of this country particularly someone like uh abraham isaac cook um the first chief rabbi here of uh, British Mandate Palestine was someone who saw the deep value uh, in in secularity and in religiosity um, as a body and soul that need each other, because a body without a soul is a corpse, and a soul without a body is a ghost, and we want to neither be ghosts nor corpses. We're going to be living, full humans. So, so Zevi, what I'm hearing from you um, is this is the sense in which uh, there's there's a lot of power and beauty uh, and value in religion. And, and there's, this, there's this project of uh, how do you also, you know, a project of balance, which is, which is what, I, what I'm hearing you say. Um, could, could, we, could we think more, could we speak more uh, to specifically, concretely, let's imagine uh, someone is uh, in, enduring what, what you may have called earlier a crisis of meaning. Um, what, what is it that that, that person you know, should be looking for um, and not, not in a particularistic, let's say, Jewish answer per se, but um, in a more universalist, universalist, uh, univer, universalistic. Is that, did I get that right? Uni yeah. Universal, yeah. universalistic uh, yeah. kind of way. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> these are these are such fun questions. It's it's so nice to to be able to do this thinking together. I, you know, there's 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 different all kinds of different like theories of mind and different metaphysics of of the relationship between mind and body, and there's one sort of iteration or strain of that which which sees mind as somehow united and and sort of this mind at large which filters into individual minds and, and i feel like the the depth and the time and the effort that you've given into thinking about these questions and, and me on my side it doesn't feel like two separate minds doing this thinking it feels like kind of the same ideas going through some sort of shared mind and and, and maybe using that more poetically than metaphysically but it's the but non-duality really... <laughs> coming out yeah. non-duality um non duality would, would also have to posit a non-duality between body and mind which is a harder one body and right. soul which 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 is very deconstructive of religion which is <laughs> a bit more of a radical point um so me yeah the meaning crisis the meaning crisis is is very real uh and i i i, I know it firsthand um, there's a lot of work being done uh, just just a, a, as a brilliant resource. Uh, there's a friend of mine over here on YouTube, um, John Verveke, who is a professor of Buddhist psychology and cognitive science, who's done a whole very, very extensive series over at his channel called Awakening from Meaning Crisis. And we've done a series of discussions together, uh, intersecting Judaism and mysticism over his research. And he's doing really, really phenomenal work. Um, both historically uh, and scientifically from the cognitive side of things and uh, bringing Neoplatonism into discussion now particularly, and I highly recommend seeing his work. Um, I think that um, it's, it's a very interesting question of, of what does it mean to have meaning? What does it mean to construct meaning? Meaning means different things in different contexts, right? So when we talk about meaning in a sentence, we don't mean the same thing as meaning in life. 
And I think that sometimes we do make these categorical mistakes where, we, 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 where we're using the one word in different contexts and we assume therefore that the word means the same thing. Um, but I think these words um, are actually equivocal in, in, their, in their subjects. Um, so I think part of the problem is that we, we look for meaning in life as if the meaning is like an answer, like 42 or something, right? And when we discover that answer, um, then we've come to, we discover the correct propositions or the, then, then we've come to meaning and we're now going to be living meaningfully. And that's not how it works because life is not an equation to be solved. Life is a thing to be lived. And, and finding meaning in an equation is different from finding meaning in life, although we use those same words, which is, which is tricky. When we talk about religious meaning and faith as well, um, we sometimes think about religious belief as, as a proposition which we, which we assert or amount to, and, and in there, there is meaning. But that's not how religion works either. Uh, faith in Judaism has a few, few different words in Hebrew and in the biblical context for it. One of them is emunah. Emunah is the same Hebrew root as omen. Omen is, is a craft, is someone with a, it's a, it's something that one invests into. There's someone that's vayhi omen et hadata is, is a verse from, from the book of Esther, where Marchai is, is spending his time nurturing their relationship. He's investing. Omanut in modern Hebrew is art. There's an art form. Emunah is to, to nurture a belief, a belief about reality. So we believe, for example, that God is good and God created the world and said, uh, behold, the world is good, God says in Genesis. To believe that the world is good is not a proposition that we that we assert and amount to. It is a way of living that takes that takes skill and it takes artfulness and it takes effort and it takes investment to, to constantly every morning wake up and, and, and affirm that the world is good and it's good to be born into this world, which is not an easy thing to affirm if you're if you're a thinking person. And in Christianity, it's the same. Christianity, uh, sometimes we make a bit of a facile distinction that, oh, Judaism, and I don't like when we do this, Judaism believes that faith is, is non-propositional. Christianity does. Christianity's not the case either. In Christianity, having belief means you're coming into a relationship with Jesus, with God. And I think that's perhaps the key point here. And that's something which I want to perhaps add to the discussions that I had with, with John um, back back a few months ago, which which wasn't fully articulated for me at the time, but I think that meaning comes in. I'll, I'll say two points. One of them is that meaning comes in relationship, right? We we in in a Christian context, there's a relationship, a personal relationship that is created between the individual and Jesus, and that's a meaningful relationship for them, and it's a guide by which they can live their lives. It's a it's a light for them that shows them the path of goodness and kindness. Christianity at its finest. The, then there's then then I think in a more broad context, let's say even even secularly speaking, what are what are the relationships that we're building? And this I'm saying this is secular, but this is a religious idea. If we think about religion as a binding, because every relationship is binding us to something, I have a relationship with the people around me, and, and I find meaning in those relationships, in my friendships, and in my in, with my students and with my mentors. And my, these are these are relationships that we build with family. Um, and I think I think we know this to be true that that's where we find relation we find meaning in 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 relation, and we only find ourselves in those relationships. We find meaning in in re- how do I relate to myself? What are the what are the, the practices and the habits of of care and productivity that I can bring into my life to to relate? That's that's in one way, and that's about showing up and being present in those relationships, and not simply about discovering some sort of number or some sort of answer or some sort of oh yes I, I discovered that God is one and therefore the world is meaningful to me no what does it mean that that God is one it means that I have to live my life in accordance with that my relationship to reality changes in that framework and I see myself differently I see the world differently and I relate to others within the purview of the unity of God and that is what is meaningful that's 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 one part of it and I think that the way to figure this out is not to do some sort of logarithmic um, algorithm to, to try and figure out like where exactly is, is, is meaning falling out here, but we know meaning because we experience things to be meaningful. And if we, if we, a better question would be to think back in the past week or month or years of our lives and be like, what was it, what were the things that I was doing that felt meaningful to me, right? Was it the, the extra hour that I, that I put into pursuing, you know, the deal at work, or was it the time that I put in to try and to perfect my art and to try and express something and try and be there for a friend and family. And, and most often than not, it's moments where we are able to put ourselves aside. I think that we live in a hyper, hyper, hyper individualistic society. And that's part of the, the framework of secularity that we live in today. And I think that hyper individualism 
is is an act of freedom. It's freedom from the collective, right? But I think that that individual that individualism comes at a very very high price, which we're just beginning to understand as a, as a society. Which is that firstly, the individuality separates us from the rest of reality. We're cut off from when we're, we're no longer inherently de- in deep relationships with the rest of reality. We are a single person standing over the abyss. You know the famous painting of of the the the, the romanticist character who's standing above the cliff seeing all of the the snowy mountains that is there's just an individual there and he's he's cut off from nature he's cut off from community he's cut off from society and i think that what we create in this hyper individualistic moment that we are, that we're in is 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 a, is, a, is the sense that if we can only focus on our own well-being and our own happiness we'll reach happiness and and the the simple re- truth and we know this from religion and philosophy and from lived experience that we're ha- and and now from scientific studies that we're happiest when we're not focusing on our own happiness on our own happiness but seeing how we can be there for others and how we can in in moments my parents run a community kitchen in sydney which feeds uh, which feeds many many hungry people in sydney they do beautiful work people come in there sydney has a very very affluent community uh, people the many many people who who are very wealthy and frankly many of them are not living happy lives you know, in their huge mansions with their huge fleets of BMWs. But when they come into the kitchen, they roll up their sleeves to do something which is selfless. They're no longer thinking about how am I advancing my career? How am I advancing my relationship? How am I going to get laid out of this? But they're thinking simply about how can I give to someone else, someone that I don't even know. There's so much joy in that. And I think there's there's meaning in that. There's meaning in in stripping away the the, the false idea that our meaning comes when we are able to simply progress as individuals. because meaning does not come through individuality it comes through relationship is what is 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 this theme that i'm trying to drive home i was just thinking about this today right before we sat down to talk i i went down i was sitting up here my in my apartment all day uh, editing this week's video and i wanted to get out and get some fresh air and i i walked down to the apartment building across the road from me and i kind of meandered just into their gardens and um and i noticed that there's kind of this very sweet uh, bunch of old gardens, they're very picturesque behind these buildings, which I've never noticed before. You know, we go very far for adventure, but this is very adventurous. And I was probably trespassing. So there was that element of criminality, which made it all the more fun. But there are these fences that are between all of the gardens and those fences like block off those gardens from being a really, really nice shared common space. We, we've we designed our urban structures and societies. The design language is one which speaks of our secularity and of our individualism and one which which breaks down any pope, any chance for us to have meaning in relationship. The buildings here are getting knocked down, and instead they they build these huge, you know, s- square buildings where there's no space for anyone to to interact, for anyone to have shared space. It's all just you're in your own apartment with your Netflix and your you know Uber Eats, and you never have to you you never get a chance. And and I think what we're doing is where we're converting our our Weltanschauung, we're, con- we're converting our the philosophy of our moments, which is this hyper individual, where I want to be entirely autonomous, and this swing away from the oppression of 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 a collective, to a direction of of this hyper individualism, which is which is strangling us, and uh, and it was so beautiful to see these like open garden spaces so close and I, and I, and I want to go and hang out there and I wish I had something like that here. It would be so much more beautiful if those fences could be taken down and, and there could be more of a common space. So. I think this is not a philosophical or technical answer because I don't think that meaning is a philosophical experience. I think that meaning is is a human experience, it's, and it's the answer has to be a sociological one. And it, we can it, through understanding the history of ideas and how we got to where we are today, that can help us unpack this. But I but I really think that people that are looking for meaning should stop reading philosophy, <laughs> and I'm saying that as someone who reads philosophy all day, and should go out and and find someone to volunteer, go to go to a special needs. Uh, school, go to an old age home, go to a go to a community kitchen. And I promise you, you'll find more meaning than you'll find even in Spinoza and Nietzsche and Schopenhauer and Descartes. Just just try it. Try it once and, and see how it goes. So <laughs> that's what I believe. The last, the last things you said there about uh, reading philosophy anticipate exactly what I wanted to to come to next, which is um, you know, when when you get a different side of Zevi when you're in these conversations versus when you're, you know, doing your your video your essays on on topics and people who, who are familiar with your channel will appreciate immediately your your deep deep scholarship like your deep uh commun- you know conversation with uh the history of philosophy and and many many different books um and and if i can uh, speculate and and maybe um romanticize or mythologize you a little bit 
uh, what, what I sort of imagine is a, is a Zevi who, um, like one of these, you know, like monks secluded himself in a, in a cabin somewhere and just uh, sat and read and read uh, endlessly, you know, until he eventually you had to come down the mountain like Zarathustra, you know, full of, uh, full of, full of wisdom and full of knowledge. And you started a, a YouTube channel so you could share some of your knowledge with us. Is that, is that, is that accurate in terms of, you know, um, like, I guess what I'm trying to do is personalize it a little bit. How, how has your path been through, through philosophy to get to where you are today? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think I think it, uh, it's accurate to an eerie degree. I'm going to have to, of course, differ with the fact that I came down full of knowledge and, uh, sorry, maybe knowledge, but full of wisdom. I think I'm still striving for wisdom. I think the, the mission says, Ben, Shivim, the save that only by 60 do we reach, do we reach wisdom. I think that's the, and I'm still far from 60. So God willing, I'll, I'll grow in wisdom. Uh, wisdom is, is really applying knowledge to our lives. And there's a lot of areas in my life where, where a lot of knowledge <laughs> needs to be applied. So, so let's, let's, but, but in terms of the accurate part of it, um, yes, there were two uh, back-to-back periods in my life. And I, I can tell you about them if you'd like where um, I literally hold myself up in a literal cabin in literal woods, <laughs> surrounded by philosophy books uh, that, I, that I begged and borrowed and, uh, and, and just read uh, for copious hours on ends, uh, days and weeks on end. Um, I, did that, I did that twice. I did that um, first. So I, I, I went through a traditional um, yeshiva education through the Chabad system. Um, starting, I grew up in Sydney, Australia, starting off there. Uh, when I was 18, I went to study in the States, in, uh, in Los Angeles, New York. Uh, then I did two years of community service, shlichut, uh, and teaching in Cape Town. Um, and I went home with the thought of doing a degree. Uh, at the time, I was very, very interested in uh, early Christianity and Second Temple literature. And I, and I wrote a paper on the subject, which, which it's part of this strange story. Um, that, but I never ended up doing the degree. I ended up just staying home um partially for religious reasons and some other reasons uh and i just basically spent a year or a year or so just reading um at the time it was still a lot of my interest in christian theology and second temple literature and second temple theology but also moving into comparative mysticism and comparative mythology um and i was pretty much um i i have i have a very easy tendency to um like disassociate from like the general societal Socratic rhythms of day and night and I would um because I'm, I'm quite a nocturnal person by nature and I would uh, literally um like be up all night reading through the night and then as the sun would begin to rise I would go to sleep and I would sleep until the sun was setting and then and then and then rinse and repeat um and it was great for me because I didn't have to interact with any humans I didn't have to talk to anyone I could just just sit and read all night and and all of us romanticists uh, and angsty teenagers know that the night is the best time to to think and read and write and to to rage against the the dying of the light I remember once I had to like go to the post office for something or like there was some like appointment like a like a dentist or something and I had to go I had to wake up during the day and there's a part of reading I would like go out and I would I live near the beach I would, I would walk the streets at night when it was like 2 a.m 3 a.m 4 a.m totally empty and, and I remember after months of doing this I had to go out to like to some for some like normal human appointment during during the morning hours and it was like totally oppressive to like have the sun shining down on me. And then to see humans on these streets, which I roam every night silently was like a very, very bizarre experience. <laughs> I was very not in, very uh, disintegrated from society, despite all this talk of, of living in community and in relationship. There was none of that happening. Uh, also like a very um, depressed period of my life in, in some ways. Um, I then came to Israel because in a very roundabout way, because of this paper that I'd written on Matthew's gospel is sort of a comparative analysis of his hermeneutics with other second temple um, period authors. Um, and I decided to stay in Israel and backpack around the country uh, for what ended up being like an eight month backpacking trip with absolutely no de- destination. I, I traveled eventually with like a tent uh, and a sleeping bag in my bag and like one pair of pants, one pair of shoes, one one shirt and then and then like half a dozen books and those books would constantly be rotating uh, as I as I finished them and picked up new ones um, and then I settled down a little and I did the same thing just from a cabin in the woods and um, I spent all in all like like after my yeshiva and after two years of teaching and 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 uh, study and all kinds of other stuff which which people that are within the community are familiar, are familiar with um, sort of just trying to figure things out for myself and interspersed with 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 some teaching and um just and 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 doing odd jobs to support myself along the way 
but um there was a sense where it's like why like what is the point of doing all this and and the point was a dual one where like both I wanted to yes like figure things out for myself and and like forge my own way in in religion and in philosophy and in life um and I and I I very much do connect to the idea of teaching and I and I see myself as a teacher and, and have since I was um like a, a late teenager and I was th thrust into that lifestyle because I was raised uh in this form of like a religious uh, missionary emissary is the Hebrew term um, and, I, and, I, and I knew that I wanted to come back to teach again but I knew that I didn't want to be teaching just the same things that I'd been taught um, in ways that weren't meaningful to me and I needed to discover them in a way that that was meaningful to me to to, to develop my own relationship with them right to to frame meaning that way um, and I and I don't think I've come to any sort of conclusion or destination I think I'm still figuring that out and I think that with every conversation genuinely every genuine conversation, like my ideas continue to shift and, and to be, I, I hope to remain malleable. Um, but, but yes, uh, I, I, I don't know if I've, how much I've shared this in public. Cause I don't try, the project is not about me. It's about the ideas and about what they might do for us. But um, I certainly had my, uh, my monastic hermetic uh, Zarathustrian moments of just living in uh, either cabins in the woods or tents on the side of the street. Uh, reading and reading and reading it's certainly certainly happened too yeah it, it's it's part of um yeah i mean it it, it comes across in your uh in the word that i that i use is wisdom it comes across in your uh you know you you've you've uh i don't know how to i don't know how to put it put it in words but um it 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 comes across in the authenticity and the and the sincerity and the uh the power of uh the the ideas that you you bring into the world um yeah, I, I'm, I'm sadly, sadly watching our time dwindle. I know we don't have a lot of time left. We'll see if maybe I can, uh, if we can do two, two more questions here. Um, sure. and, and, you know, there's no, there's not going to be any conclusion. Isn't it? We're not, we're not getting to anywhere in destination. We're just, we're just talking and, you know, each question is sort of on its own. Um, but I guess uh, maybe the second to last question uh, before we go here is like the dangers of the path. Um, we talked a little bit about the fact that religion has a very you know, negative valence for some people. Um, there's we, there's distinctions that can be made between religion and spirituality. Um, there's there's a whole uh, group of you know people who would say they're not affiliated with any religion, but they're they're spiritual seekers. Um, and 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 I, I in some sense I, I sort of count myself in that in that category with you know a recent kind of a, a change in my life where I've been much more interested in, in these kind of questions and these kind of philosophies. Um, but but I also see all around me uh, potential potential dangers and, and and pitfalls that that I that I worry about. Um, you know, just, a, you know, a, a big one is, is, you know, the being attracted to like a charismatic guru, you know, who may, may not have, you know, uh, may not be able to give you what, what you need kind of a thing. Um, and uh, we, like I said, we talked before about insular fundamentalist kind of religious perspectives. Um, so how do you navigate that in your own life? How do you avoid um, pitfalls? How would you encourage others who, you know, maybe consider themselves seekers sort of going out on this path? Uh, to to not to, to not make mistakes that you know that are that are attendant to the path. Yeah, well, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I think I think the tragedy of it is that people that are embarking on on some sort of journey of seekers, and I, I particularly like that word because it 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 it, it points to the to the open ended nature of it. Right, we're not we're not finders, we're seekers. Um, and I, I use that term specifically for that reason. Um, there, there, are some there are people that are looking for meaning and that are choosing to, in many ways, unanchor themselves from from where they are at the present, from where they're comfortable, to, uh, and doing that emotionally and spiritually and psychologically and sometimes physically, materially, to to find new paths, new avenues to traverse. And it's done with a lot of, with a lot of, uh, like a lot of genuine curiosity and openness and hope and 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 optimism um and and concern and I, I have like so much like deep love and 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 like identification with people that are doing that you know the the name that i chose for the project uh, seekers of unity is a translation from the aramaic poem uh with the stanza is uh, that, that the, the poet pray, like praises to or or requests from from the almighty the the mighty one 
to watch over of the to 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 guard over the seekers of unity like the apple of of their eye um and there's a sense that that people that are on the path of seeking do need to be guarded over like the apple of the eye like the, the most sensitive part of the body um and what it's a prayer which practicing jews recite uh, thanks to the Kabbalists every Friday night uh, to welcome the Shabbat. And, and I really think about that every Friday now when I, when I pray it. Um, I think about the people that are out there that are seeking for unity, that are trying to find wholeness and that are trying to find integration in their lives. And I, I pray like for them and with them. I'm, I'm one of them. We, like, we are the seekers of unity. It's not, it's not like a separate thing, obviously. And I think that the tragedy here is that it's precisely the people that are, that are in such a place of openness and vulnerability um, and are looking for mentorship and, and guidance often come into the hands of the of the most predatorial, um, vicious, and 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 like using people that 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 have worked this face of the earth. Some like the it's 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 a crazy it's a crazy the juxtaposition of the sincerity and the and and I've seen this I've seen this and we all know the stories right the juxtaposition of of the sincerity and the hope. And the and the, the depth of poetry and 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 inspiration that, that people are carrying with them and vulnerability to be uh, like absolutely exploited by someone who's been in a position of authority as a spiritual leader or mentor or guide or guru for 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 decades um, for simply for their own animalistic pleasure um, and thinking that they're often justifying it with the philosophies of of mysticism or the spiritual systems uh, as if they're beyond. Uh, they're beyond ethics, they're beyond, you know, hurting people, whatever, whatever, like stupid justifications they come up with. Uh, I think, I think that the antidote, I mean, there are really many, many dangers. And this is, I'm just touching on this one, because it's the one, one of the ones that you mentioned, but I think that to do justice to such a question, we'd have to speak about each individual danger and, and how best to go about it. I think that the strongest antidote to, to dangers of this nature, and, and this might be also a bit of a broader answer, uh, is information and education, like people, Unfortunately, people that are naive are the people that are going to get ripped off. If if someone doesn't know that there, that that there's a Nigerian princes that are calling people every day to try and get them to just invest just three thousand dollars that they can have a million dollars, like the best antidote is simply education. Like we can't like get educated, get knowledgeable. And I think that the more light that is shone uh, on the on the failings of the community, and which is why we have to be honest and open and transparent about our own failings, the less those things will have power there's a very very beautiful idea that 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 the early rabbis speak about in the in the midrashic literature about how god creates the world and creates light uh, on the first day the first the first act of creation god says vayhi ar um which is let there be light it's the the divine fiat uh this commandment uh, fiat lux let there be light and um the the rabbis notice something very interesting this is what the rabbis do best they they pick up they pick apart the, the text and they see that God uh, only later in the days of creation creates the sun and the moon, which means that the light of the first day of creation is not the light of the sun and the moon. And the rabbis say that that light actually is a light which has nothing to do with what we know of as light. We we have the light of the sun and the moon, and, and that's it. Um, God takes that light and God hides it, uh, and they they do this playing on playing on a verse from the book of Psalms, that God sows light, God plants light for the righteous. Um, and the notion is that God creates this light and then hides it away so that, um, so that the righteous will have it. Uh, sometimes it's described as it'll be there for the righteous at the end of days. And sometimes it'll be there uh, sort of in their lives when they need this light. It's a, a certain magical properties of this light that with the light they can see Kind of from one end of the earth to the other, and and this is brought down in in Bereshit Rabbah and in in in, in the Talmud in, in Masechet Chagiga and other places. But there's one particularly insightful twist that 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 the rabbis bring to this is, is, is that this light, which is saved for the end of days, shone upon the righteous is the reward for the righteous. It is what brings them joy and happiness. But the very same light, which is shone upon the wicked, is is painful to them, like the like the sunlight on the on the vampire where it like shrivels them up. And, and I think this is a very astute psychological and sociological insight that light, shining a light on something simply means having transparency and seeing what's going on. You know, the, uh, the film, that brilliant film that was put out um, on the Catholics, the Catholic 
uh, church sex scandal called Spotlight, right? It was the, the newspaper that, that exposed it. The brilliance of the title was that what they did was they simply, they shone a light on reality, what was hidden, what was happening in the dark, they shone a light on that. And, and, and the teaching is basically, if you are living a life where you're doing things that are despicable and disreputable and ugly and heinous and, and using other people, when the light will shine and the light will shine because the light always does shine, you will be caught with your pants down or whoever it is will be caught with the pants down. And, and that light will be a light which will eviscerate and which will burn and which will, and which will expose and not punish, but, but which, will, which will clarify and clean. But if one is living a life of righteousness, right, to use this religious term in a, in a modern sense, where they're doing acts of kindness and generosity and, and service and commitment, <clears throat> but they're not broadcasting it to the world. They're not YouTubers that are putting it all out there for everyone to see. They're doing it in the, in the silence of their own spaces. When the light is shone, that will be their reward because they'll be able to see for themselves that what they were doing was, was just and true. And so I think, I think the light, a bit, of, a bit of a long way to say, but I think that simply shedding light on what's going on, that means both taking responsibility and talking about the failings of, of our respective communities that we belong to, and also sharing light with individuals that are upon that path to teach them about the dangers of the pitfall. Someone who knows about the dangers that are, that are lying in front of them are much, are much less likely to stumble on them. There's, there's, a pro, there's a biblical prohibition <clears throat> to place a stumbling block in front of a blind person. The fine ver, the altitain michshal, that you know that a place, which means if, if there is someone who's blind, if someone who's going down a path of, of seeking and they're blind to the dangers in front of them, and we know that there are dangers there, we have an obligation to tell them, hey, there's a fork in the road, there's a this, there's a, there's a, there's a hole, there's a fire. Um, and I think, I think that is, I think that is um, a, big part of, a big part of the antidote. And maybe one last piece of the antidote is, uh, ironically, to be, I mean, everything needs to be done in balance, but, but ironically to, to be saying this after what we said earlier, but I think that there's a need for individuality as well. While there's a need for, there's a very, very important need to have mentors and to have guides and to have, to have role models that are doing things right, there's also a need to, to find, the path, find the path for ourselves and, and to be individuals on that path. And to be individual does not mean that we're not in community. It means we're in community as individuals. But to not let go of our individuality, don't let go of our critical thinking, don't believe something because someone with authority said so. If, if everything that was said with authority was true, then the world would be in a much better place. The very fact that there's still work to be done means that we still need to be thinking for ourselves. Um, and, and as much as I can, I, I like to encourage people to think for themselves. And I don't, I often don't like to give conclusions, um, in many of the classes that I give on the channel, because I want to give information. I want to shed light, but I want to encourage people to think for themselves. And I don't tell people what they should believe about God or whether they should be practicing X, Y, or Z, um, or even on small cases, whether, whether a certain academic dispute should be, should be decided one way or the other. I think people, people, we need to, we need to help people and we need to, we need to show people how to stand up on their own two feet and how to make decisions for themselves and how to learn from their own mistakes. And I think, I think, that's, re and, and I think that's really important. And, and that has to be balanced with the value of having people that we do respect um, and having people that we, that we can take guidance from, but as individuals and as people that are thinking about what we're accepting. Yeah. And maybe just uh, to sort of add to that, sort of when, if you're, you know, the seekers, there should be an emphasis on the unity as well, where if you're, if you're seeking, but if from a place of, um, of difference and, and sort of particularity, uh, there's danger there. There's danger in, in being overly uh, enamored with, with one very sort of specific, particularistic kind of worldview and exclusion to other people and exclusion to other perspectives. And I think that's a big danger as well. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah, I think in exclusion is, is the operative word there because I, I think it's okay to be enamored with, I'm, I'm deeply enamored with, with Judaism and with Hasidism, but if it's the exclusion of other things, then, then there's the problem. And even when it comes to, I mean, the, the way, I think that the way that the mystics frame our relationship to the self and the ego, we're allowed to be enamored with ourselves. We're allowed to be proud to be who we are, but it can't be to the exclusion of the rest of existence, right? Me, me being me doesn't exclude someone else being incredible and being bright and being brilliant and me having something to learn and benefit from them. But, um, but but, uh, but we, we don't have to eradicate, this is a big mistake, the way that we speak about it. sort of the eradication of self and ego death. I think it's a topic which needs a lot of clarifying, but it might be its own topic. Yeah. Well, this is, look, and this has been a marathon conversation. I want to, it's sort of a strange way to end, but let's, I just want to share one thing with you before we go. I mean, you've been so generous with your time and I've, I've loved this. And uh, this has certainly been the longest uh, conversation I've done for this channel. Um, but just, I guess, again, maybe a strange way then, but I just want to share with you a poem, a short little Hebrew poem that's, that's meaningful to me. Um, and then you can maybe uh, tell me if it has any rest with you or not. 
um, it's Please. meaningful to the, to sort of the, this, the way I see my, my own spiritual kind of evolution in the past, let's say year or so. Um, it's, it's a poem, very short little poem by, by Israeli playwright, uh, Hanukh Levine. Uh, I'll read in Hebrew. It translates very, very fluidly to English. It says, Shmerel mocher liberal, uberel kone migetzel, ubetoch kulam, kemochor betoch begel, haketz, hamechune gam ketzel. So in, in English, it's like Shmerel sells, sells to barrel. It's the names, of course, and barrel, you know, buys from getzel. But in, in all of them, like the hole inside the bagel is this death, uh, which they also call Detzel. You know, they have like a nickname for it. Um, and it's, you know, I guess if I sort of to characterize what, what it's meant for me to sort of, you know, uh, think about these kind of, you know, spirituality or, or kind of uh, you know, looking, looking at, at certain topics, which I never looked at really when I was younger, when I came from a much more rationalistic kind of Jewish perspective. It's like, it's the sense of... Um, you know, how much of my, my time do I spend not looking at the void, not looking at like the, the emptiness at the core of my being or the core of reality or the death that, you know, is sort of in all of us. You know, we, we could talk a lot about this poem. We could talk about how this is, you know, the, the death of like the post-Holocaust generation or there's a lot you could say about it. But it's a, that's a poem that resonates with me. And I just wonder if, um, if you had any thoughts on that before we, before we conclude here. Uh, it's a great it's a great poem. I love I love the, uh, the juxtaposition of, of the whimsy right. and, and the, the deep existential the death uh and cats is also an interesting word um which 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 in modern hebrew has those connotations of of the of one's own personal terminus and end but cats has a very very rich history uh, i'm sure you know in in jewish literature of the typically typically referred to as the end of exile you know the end of suffering um it's a biblical expression of of kate son like god sends a, a boundary a limit on darkness there's only so far that that evil and suffering goes no and past that point we come to redemption and light um there's a whole a whole a whole topic in, in the history of jewish theology of mechashve kate those that try to predict when the end date of the exile would happen and and uh maimonides gets pulled into this drama as well of uh, of of cursing people who who said who said a cat and and then giving a cat himself so it's a very 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 rich term in and and the israeli poets that are writing in this period they they, they know that and they're they're pulling on these traditions in, in brilliant and beautiful ways um i think that um i think that as opposed to death being something that uh that is a terrifying thing and that that sort of gives the lie to all of our attempts and is the, the grand equalizer which makes all of our moments of beauty and meaning meaningless i think to the contrary and, and in this way i've been deeply influenced by the existentialists um and whether that's kierkegaard or heidegger or satra or camus uh, or or someone even like colin wilson the the english existentialist where where it's precisely death which gives our lives meaning um and i think i think this is i think we know this to be intuitively true um, and uh, and there there are great philosophical ways that that this has arrived. Whether it's you know Nietzsche's thought experiment of the eternal return, which I think is widely misunderstood, but is actually arguing for this point precisely, where we don't value plastic flowers the way that we value uh, flowers of of dirt and sunlight, um, because because something that is just going to go on forever and ever. There's no there's no need for us to stop and appreciate it. And the value in a thing is not that it's going to exist forever, right? There's this, there's this old theological notion that, that if there is no such thing as the afterlife, then everything we do here is meaningless. And I think quite to the contrary. And I think that many of the mystics, particularly the Hasidic mystics, my own tradition, did not really care much for the afterlife at all. And they did not see it as a place of value. They saw, and I mean that in a, in a, in a philosophical and theological sense, they didn't see eternity as vouching for value. They saw the moment as eternal. And moments when we can sit down and have conversations that are that are honest and open and encounter and share our feelings and get personal, these are not, as you said before, we're not we're not trying to get anywhere. There is no eternal, you know, bank account that we're trying to invest in. We're trying to be fully present and fully and fully alive in these moments. And these moments are are where that meaning is. And I think that is that is vouchsafed for us precisely by death, right? If if we were never going to die, then we would never have any any need to do anything because we could we could always do it. I think I think our mortality uh, is 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 where our beauty and where where our where our drive and where our meaning comes from. And I think that um, I think that there's something really really powerful there. And I think that we need to. Uh, who was it? Socrates who said that the point of philosophy is to teach us how to die. Uh, we have to. We, we've become so disconnected from death in our in our hyper sanitized world where we no longer see death. We no longer experience death. One of one of one of a real privilege of my brief time. 
uh, in in you know the world the world of religious rabbinate and whatnot was that I got to spend a lot of time around dead and dying people. And I don't mean that in the everyday sense when you walk down the street and you see dead people all the time because they're <laughs> wandering around and they're just you know waiting for for a bus to hit them or something. God forbid. But I mean people that are biologically like actually dead. And uh, and I there was typically one 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 period in particular. It was almost every single Sunday where I would go to the cemetery to. Uh, for for uh, for either a funeral or for a, for askara for for a tomb stone unveiling and dedication and starting off like the first the first first morning of my week Sunday morning uh, in the cemetery was was the most uh, grounding and invigorating invigorating meaning literally life giving experience that I could have had because it allowed me to radically this is such a cliche but worth repeating it allowed me to radically reorientate reorientate my my own values and my own drives the week and and we we know we know we all know that like when the end comes and and our bodies are ready to be lowered into ground the moments before that we're not going to be thinking about oh if only we would have had like a better investment if only we would have like been able to have like a better whatever like it's the things that we spent like much of our time chasing pursuing if only we would have made it a bit further in the rat race and if only we would have had a, a bigger nicer car than our neighbor like those are not it's like we, we know that we're going to be thinking about like, oh, I like, I had those moments to have those beautiful connections and those beautiful friends and those beautiful moments with strangers and families and, and moments of kindness and service. And, um, and I think that we need death to remind us of that. So, so Socrates says that philosophy is to teach us how to die. Um, and Maimonides philosophy seems poised to be teaching us how to die, a kiss of death, a kiss of, of, of unity and intimacy and, 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 and beauty um, the the grandest death that the rabbinic literature, that Jewish literature knows, and I think that um, part of the process of the mystics is to be constantly dying. Is actually to be dying all the time, and and only when we die and let go of who we thought we were in every moment do we allow ourselves to be reborn. And we're reborn every single morning. The Jewish mystics teach that every single morning we say that where we died when we slept, in some sense, the Talmud says, and, and we're reborn every morning and a chance to, to create a new identity. And, and I say these things and I repeat them because I, I want to be experiencing them. And, I, and, 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 and part of a way for me to integrate them is to, be, is to be talking about them. And when I wake up tomorrow morning, I'll think about this conversation I had with you and I'll, I'll, I'll reflect. I'm like, oh, if I, if, I, if I was speaking with Amichai about the chance to be reborn in the morning, I can also use this as a chance to be reborn and I can break a bad pattern. I don't need to check my phone first thing in the morning. I can be, I can be born a new person. So, and I think that is embracing death. That's embracing a perpetual death and it's embracing a final death. And it's, I think it's the, the death of the bagel, <laughs> the hole in the bagel that uh, is, is what gives the bagel meaning or else it would not be a bagel at all. Zevi, I'm going to uh, value this conversation for a long time and this, uh, this, this sharing. And, and thank you so much for, for giving uh, me your, your time and giving us your time and your wisdom. Uh, this has been really, uh, really, really a pleasure and a thrill. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. I, I, I'm going to hold it and cherish it as well for years to come. God willing.